Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have everyone here. Um, and I'm really grateful for the uh, my co-panelists in this webinar this evening. Um, I am Dr. Mary Mulcahy. I'm a sports medicine surgeon at Tulane, and I'm the director of our women's sports medicine program. I'm very happy to be hosting this and, and grateful for my colleagues here at Tulane, too, that helped us coordinate this. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Matskin um, from Brigham and Women's. Good evening, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Matskin. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon that specializes in sports medicine in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and I also am the chief of our women's sports medicine program. Uh, I'm from the class of 1998 from the Tulane School of Medicine. Um, as a former female athlete, um, I've always been passionate about caring for our female athletes and therefore, uh, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. So thanks for joining. Thanks, Liz, so much for being here. Um, next, I want to introduce Jay Lloyd. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Jay Lloyd. Um, I played four years of Division I collegiate volleyball at the University of Tennessee and Tulane University. I got my master's degree from Tulane University. I then went on to coach Division I volleyball, and I have been coaching for 11 years now, and I am currently coaching at the University of California at San Diego. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Nicole Fanu. And Nicole, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, very happy to have you here. Hello, uh, my name is Nicole. I am a current junior at Tulane. I'm studying environmental science, sociology, and GIS. And I am on our women's cross country and track and field teams. Um, I mainly specialize in the 3K, 5K, and 10K. Awesome. And, uh, and I failed to kind of give my athletic background too, but I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't, I didn't add that to the group. Um, I ran track when I was at Dartmouth. I was a long jumper and a sprinter and uh, really developed a passion for sports medicine from that. And, and just my specific focus and interest in women's sports medicine has grown from that and just uh, being a, a woman, in ortho, woman in orthopedics and specializing in sports medicine. So I think at this point, we will start uh, kind of with our overview on um, the topic that we're going to focus on for our webinar this evening. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the female athlete and energy deficiency. These are my disclosures, none of which are directly relevant to this talk. As some of our objectives, you know, certainly our goal is to help define relative energy deficiency in sport and its connection to the female athlete triad. We also hope that by the end of this webinar that you'll have a better understanding of the risk factors associated with Red S for both female and male athletes and be better able to identify opportunities for clinical management and treatment of Red S and its associated symptoms in athletes. I'm gonna provide some background information and touch on the definition and categorization of REDIS, focus on some of the assessment tools and, and diagnosis of REDIS, and then really ways that we can prevent and treat uh, REDIS and help get our athletes safely back to play. So the female athlete triad was originally defined in 1992 and further described in 2005 by the International Olympic Committee consensus statement. Later evidence and clinical observation helped us understand that the underlying factor really was energy deficiency due to an imbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. So when this diagnosis was first made, the female athlete triad, it really was the three extremes of these conditions. That is uh, amenorrhea, osteoporosis, and anorexia. But we've since realized that it's really a continuum along this spectrum and that the underlying issue is energy deficiency. In 2014, the International Olympic Committee noted that this is not actually a triad, but a syndrome resulting from relative energy deficiency and that it affects many aspects of athletes' health, including psychological well-being. And that is really a critical component to keep in mind. 
Additionally, male athletes showed symptoms of this issue. So REDS is a constellation of clinical findings that's related to low energy availability. It affects many physiological functions, including metabolic rates, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, and psychological health, as I mentioned. And again, it is not sex specific. And so in terms of categorizing REDS, the criteria um, used to categorize it are based on the model of the Norwegian Olympic Training Center. And it's recommended by the International Olympic Committee Body Composition Health and Performance Working Group. And the three categories are red, yellow, and green lights. And that defines risk categories from high to low that aid in the assessment and determining when our athletes are safe to return to play. So early detection of red S is very important. It improves athlete performance, decreases the risk of injury and prevents long-term health consequences. And the question may arise, you know, when should we be doing an assessment? When should we try to identify red S? Well, one good, you know, one time that may work is during the kind of pre-participation sports physical, this annual, you know, health exam. Certainly anytime an athlete presents with symptoms related to disordered eating, menstrual dysfunction, recurrent injuries or mood changes. And absolutely we wanna assess as early as possible when an athlete is observed to have any relevant symptoms. So this green category is defined as low risk. And this is when athletes have healthy evening, eating habits, appropriate energy availability. They overall have normal, normal hormonal and metabolic function and a healthy musculoskeletal system. Yellow is moderate risk. And this is where athletes have abnormally low body fat percentage or weight loss, abnormal endocrine profiles, reduced bone mineral density, maybe a history of stress fractures and disordered eating behavior. And then they may also demonstrate a lack of progress in their treatment or non-compliance. Red is the highest risk category. And this is when athletes have the extremes of these conditions. So anorexia nervosa or other diagnosed eating disorders, other serious medical conditions that are related to low energy availability or extreme weight loss techniques that can lead to life-threatening conditions. So diagnosis, it's important to keep in mind that the symptoms are often subtle or intentionally hidden. And so we really need to have a high index of suspicion during our screening processes. And the diagnosis, again, should focus on identifying the underlying issue, which is low energy availability. Currently, male-specific questionnaires for red S do not exist, but they are in development. So some specific questionnaires for the female athletes are the LEAF questionnaire, which is low energy availability in females. This includes information about recent injuries and reproductive and GI function. It was introduced initially for females that were at risk of the female athlete triad. And the brief questionnaire focuses on self-reported symptoms linked to low energy availability and disordered eating. And again, it's developed for detection of at-risk athletes. There's also the Female Athlete Triad Coalition Risk Tool, which includes recommendations for return to play and is overall more comprehensive. This is scored on a scale from zero to two with zero being no risk and two being high risk. This um, risk tool assesses for six different factors and these include low energy availability, low body mass index, delayed menarche, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, and low bone, bone mineral density and stress fractures. So all, all um, important categories to keep in mind. In terms of prevention, so increasing awareness and understanding of red S is the most essential preventative measure. This is absolutely critical. A 2018 survey of collegiate athletic trainers found that only 33% had heard of red S. And a 2015 survey of physicians at three academic hospitals found that only 37% of respondents had heard of the triad and overall awareness was more common among orthopedic surgeons. So promoting wellness is very important for all of us that are involved in taking care of athletes, right? So it's important to, to let everyone know that thinness and leanness does not equate with better performance and that promoting healthy body image and nutrition at, habits in athletes is really important for both, again, male and female athletes because this promotes a sense of lifelong wellness. In terms of treatment, this is absolutely a team-based approach. It's critical. We need to involve the athletes, the family, the whole medical team, coaches and athletic trainers, and other members of the athlete support system so that we have everyone on the same page. Um, treatment may involve dietary changes, and this is not just increasing caloric intake, 
but also involving nutritional education and modification of different food choices. Training modifications may be required, right? Adjusting exercise regimens and goals. And in severe cases, we may need to remove athletes from competition or training in order to improve their health. Pharmacologic treatment, you know, there's still um, not uh, well-defined clinical trials. Um, there are studies that show that oral contraceptives should not be used to help regain menses or improve bone mineral density. But there are some short-term transdermal estrogen therapies with cyclic oral progestin that are suggested for females who have not regained menses after nutrition and exercise intervention. There's also this red S clinical assessment tool, which has been uh, defined. It's not yet clinically validated, but it's based on the sport concussion assessment tool or the SCAT-3, which is a step, and this is a stepwise approach to patient evaluation. It also includes a treatment contract which lays out a clear regimen for a treatment plan to help facilitate buy-in with the athlete. So some final thoughts and just kind of uh, summary points. Further development is absolutely needed for red S assessment and diagnostic tools. The subtlety and individualized nature of the symptoms means that early detection of low energy availability is absolutely critical. So education about red S for all of us involved, including athletes, athletic trainers, the orthopedic surgeons, other physicians, is really important because that is the best prevention strategy. And currently there are no standardized return to play protocols, but it would be helpful to further define these parameters. So here I just put together kind of a, a collage of pictures of all of us doing various athletic endeavors. We're really, uh, we're really excited that all of you are here today and we're looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Um, we're happy to answer any questions as part of the uh, the remainder of the webinar. So I will start, we're going to kind of be keeping an eye on the chat, um, but I'm going to start, um, Liz, I wanted to put a question out to you. Um, you know, as director of your, your women's sports medicine program at Brigham and Women's, can you describe for us, you know, a typical patient or an athlete that you might see in clinic uh, where you have a concern for red S and how would you manage that patient initially? So yeah, this is something that we see somewhat regularly. It's usually a high school or collegiate athlete that presents with pain and enough pain that they're now unable to play their sport or participate in whatever uh, exercise regimen they were um, taking part in. Usually by the time it gets to my office, it's a bone stress injury or a stress fracture. So the few things that I keep in mind is that, you know, the athletes don't always have to quote unquote, look the part. Um, they don't have to be overly thin or look undernourished or, you know, usually when I ask them about their nutrition, the majority of my athletes believe that they're at least eating a healthy diet and getting the appropriate energy or calories that they need for their energy expenditure. Um, I think I always work on getting a detailed history, trying to understand what's changed in their training regimen or in their competition, uh, making sure that they have, you know, the right shoes on their feet if they're a runner, um, that they haven't upped their mileage or their training intensity drastically. Um, so training history is really important. Um, I always ask about their menstrual history as well as their nutrition. Um, I also try and explain to them why I'm asking these questions if they're coming to see me with leg pain or foot pain or hip pain. And then all of a sudden I'm asking about, you know, what do you have for breakfast and lunch? And do you have a normal menstrual cycle? Um, I try and explain to them the reasons why, um, you know, and that often the underlying problem when we see a bone stress injury is actually their nutrition and their energy balance. Um, I think, when I see these athletes um, talking about potential long-term consequences and bone health is very important. Um, and also just like you mentioned, having a team that I can refer them to. So if they're struggling you know, with something that's a little bit out of my orthopedic realm, whether it's physical therapy or primary care or nutrition or endocrine, that I have that in my, you know, my kind of armamentarium of uh, referrals where I can get them plugged in with the right people. Uh, lastly, if they are on a high school or collegiate team, I usually get their permission to make sure that I can talk to their parents, their coaches, their athletic trainers, and make sure that everyone's on the same page with uh, managing 
um, this, this injury and the relative energy deficiency. That's fantastic. Those are all like excellent points that you brought up. And I, I like your comment too, about helping them understand why you're asking questions that are seemingly unrelated, right? So I think athletes come in and they don't understand that the shin pain actually could be related to their, you know, lack of periods or irregular periods or their, um, you know, their eating habits. And uh, a lot of times too, it may not necessarily be that they're purposely modifying their eating habits, right? That it's just more that there's just not enough kind of fuel in the tank, right? Not enough, not enough um, nutrition, not enough calories to account for all the energy that they're expending. Uh, and so, yeah, we really have the opportunity to, to educate them a lot. Were you going to say something else? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, especially during preseason, uh, when some of these teams may be having double sessions, um, and especially as the season starts to ramp up and the intensity ramps up, you know, our nutrition has to ramp up to, to stay um, intact with it. Excellent point. Uh, Jay, from a coach's perspective, so uh, if you, you know, have, I know you have the whole team who are helping to take care of the athletes from the head coach, assistant coach, athletic trainers, et cetera. But from a coach's standpoint, if you had a concern, how do you approach that? I think we as coaches spend probably the most time around the athletes because we are in the thick of it with them. We're at the games, we're going to their training sessions, we're at every practice, um, we get reports on them. So I think just knowing their personalities and from experience, I know I can watch kids at practice and I see them kind of peter out, you know, maybe halfway through practice and I'll you know, say, Hey, what would you have for lunch today? What'd you eat today? And then they stop and think about it. And they're like, well, I had a granola bar at eight o'clock this morning and that's it. I'm like you're working on zero energy, zero fuel. So just really knowing your athletes and knowing your resources within your department of where you can point them to. Um, we have a really great nutritionist and that's been huge for us and teaching the kids how they can fuel themselves and um, just quick and easy nutritional options because I know when kids come in and they're freshmen and they're new, it can be very overwhelming the schedule and they don't prioritize eating. That's what, one of the things that for whatever reason always falls to the wayside. And so when I see kids kind of start towards the end, we practice towards the end of the day and sometimes I just kind of see them you know, petering out towards the end of practice. And a lot of times it's because they're just, they don't have the fuel and they don't have anything left. So. Yeah. So do you, I mean, it's excellent that you guys have eat pretty easy access to um, a sports nutritionist or whatnot. Is that something that's built into your training program? Do you have education built in or it's just, you know, how do you decide when, when the athletes get exposure to that? So oh, we have that's available. We um, require our kids actually to have some training in that regard. They meet with the nutritionist as a team during preseason. And actually right now we're having our kids meet with the nutritionist on an individual basis, just so they can build that relationship and feel comfortable going to her and asking for help. And also um, just so they have ideas. So when they're on the run and also we have a snack station, which is awesome. So they feel comfortable just running in there and grabbing something. So we, we also just always have snacks at practice. So, you know, gone to three classes and you haven't eaten and you show up to practice. We as coaches say, Hey, sit down, have a snack at least before you jump into this, because that's going to make you better for practice, better for your teammates and better for your health. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. It's so nice that they have easy access to that. Uh, Nicole, from a current very high level athletes perspective, um, can you talk to us a little bit about your nutrition habit? You know, not your personal nutrition habit, but how you kind of modify things as you're, you know, progressing through your season versus off season. Like, do you take into account your additional running? Like what, what do you do? What do your teammates do? Yeah. I mean, I think, especially uh, like what um, Jay was saying is like when you're first a freshman, you don't recognize how important it is to be properly fueled. Um, now that I have the experience, I recognize, okay, if I'm running 13 miles this morning, I need to fuel beforehand. I need to fuel after the fact, because otherwise when I'm either don't make it through practice or I'm in classes later in the day, I'm just really tired. Uh, especially just from an injury prevention thing. I've from the standpoint of injury prevention, I've realized just how important it is to fuel throughout the day. Thankfully we also have access to a fuel station at Tulane. So it's easy to just come in, grab stuff, 
Um, and it's also, I, we also have a nutritionist here that works with athletes. So if you want, it's, I think it's really important that you have that educational thing. Cause as we know, sometimes you don't realize that you do need more information on nutrition. You're like, okay, I eat enough. Like, it seems like I, I snacked throughout the day. I'm totally fine. But I think people don't realize they have an issue until they end up with stress fractures or whatever else. Right. So it's not only eating something, but exactly like the, the, what you're eating, right? The types of food. So I've, I've definitely learned uh, over, you know, the past several years that it's important not just to ask, do you eat breakfast and lunch? Because, uh, you know, to some that's, oh yeah, I had a diet Coke for lunch. That's lunch, right? No, that's not lunch. But so important to ask, like, what did you eat? Um, and so those are excellent points that you made, Nicole. Um, Jay, you know, we, we touched a little bit about how your, your whole team approach, the coaches and athletic trainers, if your, your athletic trainer or athletic trainers kind of had suspicion or were concerned that one of the athletes was demonstrating symptoms of, uh, you know, relative energy deficiency, how would he or she handle that? What would be their steps in terms of managing that athlete? I think, uh, well, it would depend if we're in or out of season if we're in season, they are eating a lot around us. We can kind of see what their intake is. Um, if we are at a season, you're less privy to that information. So I think, again, it goes back to relationships. And that's one thing that we've learned. Um, that usually it's who has the better relationship. So the trainer, our trainer has a very good relationship with most of our athletes. So just having that conversation, our kids are very straightforward and they usually don't try to hide things because they trust that we're trying to help them if we're asking them serious questions. So I think it would just be an open, honest conversation with the individual athlete and getting more information about what they're doing on a daily basis to take care of themselves as far as that goes. And do you have, um, do you feel like you have a good connection with either primary care sports medicine physicians or an orthopedic um, surgeon? Like if you guys had concern and wanted to bring the athlete kind of to that next level, do you have the ability to do that? Yes, we have the ability to do that. I don't know that it would be as swiftly as we would like it to be in all cases, um, but we do have that option, yes. Excellent. Yeah. So it's just kind of getting back to what Liz was saying too, is this interdisciplinary approach and how it's so critical to taking care of these athletes. Um, Liz, with the, you know, the athletes and patients you take care of and the different teams you cover there, um, what's your interaction with even athletic trainers? Like, would it be on, a, on an informal basis, even somewhat that an athletic trainer may uh, sort of ask you kind of a sideline consult, just what do you think about this? Or I have this athlete that I'm concerned about and how, how would that interaction go? Yeah, absolutely. I have, um, I think, you know, what I think Jay was touching on was really the most important things, which are awareness and communication. So one, you know, most of our athletes may not even be aware of Red S. And so just having, making sure our coaches, our athletic trainers, everyone involved, you know, has an awareness of, of this and then communication is key. So, you know, most of my athletic trainers are very comfortable either picking up the phone to call me, texting me, sending me an email. If they have a concern about any of their athletes, um, you know, if they're worried about any bone stress injury, we jump on that pretty quickly. Uh, but I, I agree. I think the athletic trainers usually have a very good relationship with these athletes and the athletic trainers and the coaches are the ones that have eyes on them on a daily basis. And so I think it's almost like your kids, like, you know, when something's not quite right or they're not performing or something's off. And so that awareness and being able to communicate it is key in trying to, you know, identify any of these risk factors as soon as possible. And I think, you know, when we look at some of the, the actual data on this and some of the studies that have been done, 30 to 40% of all of our athletes in NCAA sports have at least one risk factor. So, you know, whether they've had some issues with their menstrual cycle, whether they've had a history of a stress fracture or whether their, you know, energy balance is not quite as good as they think it is. So this is, can be very prevalent. And I think a lot of our athletes are kind of on the edge at all times, and it's very easy for them to fall off if they train too hard and they don't eat enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that that gets back to a key point that we touched on a little bit in providing the overview, right? That when the female athlete triad was first, di the diagnosis was first proposed, it really was the extreme ends of those diagnoses, right? So anorexia, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. And if you didn't have those, 
then you didn't, you were not diagnosed with the condition, but with a lot of research and, you know, following patients, we realized that it's a spectrum and that having any one of these symptoms, right, raises the red flag and raises suspicion. And so for, you know, for us as the team physicians or whatnot, or Jay as coach or Nicole as an athlete, and whether it's, you know, in one of your athletes or one of your teammates or someone on another team, like you may see something you're like, oh, well, that's a little bit concerning or that's not quite right. And, um, and so the more that we're educated, the more people are aware, the more likely um, the athletes are to get diagnosed and treated sooner. Um, and so that gets, you know, very nice transition to kind of the next area of focus is like, how do we, how do we make sure that everyone who needs to be educated is? So Nicole, from your standpoint, um, as a current athlete, like what is, you know, um, what are some things that you are exposed to education wise now? And what would be your ideal? Like, what would you want? What, what do you, you know, what do you want to have access to? Yeah, I think right now, a lot of that information would come from our athletic trainers. And I feel like most people on our team have a really good source of communication with them as well as a lot of trust. I think trust is an important thing with the athletic trainers. Um, but in an ideal situation, I think it'd be really, really good during preseason if we could all sit down and have that conversation. Because I believe when you have that conversation as a team, you recognize, okay, this is out there. And then we can be more aware of the resources that we have. Also, I feel like it's easier to start conversations about something when we've already talked about something. Like, so I'm like, okay, like now that I see this in a teammate or I see this myself, it's easier for me to reach out to my athletic trainers or our team doc or whoever else, my coaches, in order to address that. Because I feel like once you've opened that line of communication, it becomes a lot easier to um, deal with that as a team. Yeah, that's an excellent point, right? And then everybody has some sort of background knowledge on it. And, and then you can say, oh yeah, we've talked, like you sort of like got the initial discussion out of the way. And then now we're all aware that this is, this can happen. This is a risk and it's easier to talk about. It. I think that's really an excellent point. Um, and, and having something incorporated into the preseason is great because it's like leads in, like I said, it just, it, it opens that up. So very, very important for everybody to have access to that. Uh, you know, when I was, running in college, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was sort of a while ago now. <laughs> um, we didn't talk about this at all. And I mean, red S didn't even exist as a diagnosis, but female athlete triad did. And, and we didn't talk about it then. Um, and I think back to even when I was in high school and, you know, one or two of my um, teammates from soccer or track who just every once in a while wouldn't be able to run or wouldn't be able to play. And I didn't quite understand why. Uh, and now I have a much better understanding. So it was just related to this, not quite having enough energy, not being strong enough or not having enough kind of, um, fuel there to be able to, to play. So, um, Jay for, uh, for you guys there in San Diego, is there anything that either as an the institution as a whole, or for your team specifically that you guys make a point to do in terms of educating your athletes, um, on red S on sort of low energy availability, those types of things. No, I would not say that's something that we have excelled at. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of our kids are even very aware of it. I've had some conversations with our trainers about it and so and our physicians and I know they are aware of it, but it's definitely the education being passed on to the athletes specifically is lacking a little bit. And I think um, to kind of follow up with what Nicole was saying, just having that conversation and making the kids aware of it and not having a stigma around it just so they know what it is and if it's something that they think that they're feeling they can come talk about it and we can work through it together um, because I think a lot of those conversations the kids think oh this is something and it might be something that's wrong with me so I don't want to bring it up or I don't want to talk about it so introducing it early to the kids and letting them know that you know this is something that we can help you with and we can work through this together, I think it's very important. Do you think that it would be something like Nicole was saying too, like even in that preseason period, having some sort of overview talk or would it be a pamphlet? Would, be a, would it be something that they watch online? Like what do you, what would you envision would be a good way to educate your athletes? I think something direct talking to somebody because athletes today, they, at least my athletes have a lot of questions. And so when things are interactive, they get more involved when they can have their questions answered. I think that's better. So definitely if it could be a back and forth conversation, something I think would be most beneficial. Yeah, that's awesome. So maybe, maybe even as a uh, sort of follow-up to this webinar, um, 
you know, it's something you can talk to your, the team physicians about too, and maybe they can help coordinate that. Uh, you know, and I'm sure it's not only volleyball, it's very relevant to track and, and many of the other women's sports. Uh, and maybe it's something they can sort of implement uh, institution wide. And I think all of us, you know, you're not alone there, right? So it's the same everywhere that I've been. It's just, I think we're thinking more and more now about how important education is mm-hmm. um, and education, educating on a broad sense. So certainly I think all of us that interact with athletes and patients and not like we take time to educate as much as we can. Um, but, uh, but doing this sort of preemptively, I think is really important and just making that kind of the standard and eliminating the stigma, any sense of stigma, like you t- mm-hmm. touched on Jay, that, you know, this is just to be aware of this. Like, I think one thing that's sort of funny when, you know, when I see female athletes who either are, have, are not having periods at all, or have irregular menses, I tell them, or just sort of in general, I say, if you have teammates who are not having their periods, like, it's, they may think it's kind of cool, like, oh, great, I don't have my period, but actually that's not a good thing. And, and, and it's just helping them understand why that's not a good thing uh, and sort of how, what's the downstream effect of that. Um, and Liz, in Boston at Brigham and Women's and, and you know, some of the schools and programs that you cover, is there any education that you guys have built in, um, whether it's the same or sort of different ways to educate the athletes and parents? Uh, what do you guys have in place? So I think there's several different levels. I think for, you know, as you briefly mentioned for pre-participation physical exams, having some of those kind of screening questions on the, um, the sheets that the athletes or their parents fill out depending on their age, um, a kind of a pre-screening tool. Uh, we've spent time um, meeting with different teams. We've held um, events talking about female athlete, Red S and these sorts of things at high schools um, and in the community. Uh, just to try and bring more awareness. Uh, we, um, we have some educational events just through, you know, Harvard and the Brigham, and we usually will reach out to our physical therapists and our athletic trainers uh, to make sure they're invited because, you know, they really, again, are the ones that are working with these athletes on a daily basis. Um, so I think there's different ways. I mean, I think the NCAA has done a good job of mandating kind of concussion education and perhaps uh, Red S will soon follow in its footsteps. Yeah, we can only hope. I mean, it certainly is critical and can have a lot of downstream effects. So, um, you know, there, there is obviously a ton of concussion education, but I agree Red S should be right up there with it because of the huge impact. And, and we made this point in, in kind of the overview at the beginning, but really, really important for us to keep in mind, like here we're focusing on the female athlete but this affects male athletes too. And so just remembering that too, um, and that this is really a broad education and helping coaches, et cetera, understand that this can affect male athletes as well um, is really important. Yeah, one more thing to add to that, Mary, is you know, when we define an athlete, you know, I know we're kind of focusing a lot here on you know, college and NCAA and collegiate athletes, but you know, anyone who's exercising is you know, quote unquote, an athlete. And we can you know, see this red S in our, you know, very young athletes, as well as our, you know, middle-aged couch to 5k runners. So this is not exclusive to, you know, only high level athletes. Um, and so I think that's really important. And, and even our very high level athletes, um, our Olympic athletes and our professional athletes who have, a lot more resources and probably, you know, have a menu picked out for them. They're watching their calories very carefully and their energy intake. They can still struggle uh, with some of these signs and symptoms. And I think the the most, most important thing that I, I really want everyone on the webinar to take home tonight is that if you're struggling with a relative energy deficiency, it affects your bone health and not just for the now, but for the long term. And so especially in our youth athletes, they can build their bone density till about the age of 18, they get about 90% of their bone density. And then maybe at the age of 25, you've really got as much bone density as you're gonna build. So over the age of 25, you don't, you can't build your bone density. So this is really, really important in our young athletes. If they're struggling with any of these signs and symptoms, especially if they're amenorrheic, they are losing bone density that's never going to be replaced throughout their life. So um, the short-term consequences may not be that severe, but when they become my age or older, 
and osteoporosis and fragility fractures become a problem, they're going to really wish they may have addressed some of these issues earlier on in life. That's, an, that's a really an excellent point so that everybody understands there are long-term implications for this. Um, the year after I graduated from college, I worked at Mass General actually in Boston and did clinical research. And one of the studies I worked on was related to um, sort of osteoporosis in young women who had anorexia. And, and it was a really uh, an eye opener for me to see these 18 to 20 year old women with density of an 80 year old woman. And uh, so that's a, a, a difficult thing to sort of swallow, but very important to understand and, and gives you a better understanding even of why we want to treat this, you know, diagnose, treat, and, and really prevent this um, so that our athletes don't have these long-term uh, consequences. Um, Jay, you know, we've, we've talked clearly about the importance of education, um, you know, educating our athletes, educating the coaches. Who else? I mean, there are a lot of staff, a lot of people involved with taking care of the athletes. And Liz touched on a few other groups, right? The physical therapists, the athletic trainers, um, some other, you know, ancillary staff, but who, who need to be educated, who need to understand because they're interacting with these patients and athletes all the time. But Jay, are there other groups of people from the coaching perspective who you, who are working frequently with the athletes who also would benefit from being educated? I think there's definitely, I think first and foremost, um, strength and conditioning coaches, they spend a lot of times with a lot of time with the athletes watching them um, export a lot of energy, obviously, and they get them usually early in the morning, at least for us. So if they haven't had breakfast, they're definitely probably going to be performing a little bit differently at that time. Um, and then also I would say academic people who they're having meetings with as they're coming to and from class throughout the day, they have a pretty good read on them. And then I know our administrator or our sports supervisor pops in and out and will have meetings with the kids and develops pretty good relationships with them. So, you know, when she's observing, she also has a good pulse for what's going on with the group as well. Right. So critical. These are groups that we may not think about all the time, but are having regular interaction with athletes and in different capacities. And to see them, you know, if they, for example, the academic, you know, staff that you noted, they may see kind of a decline or a change in their academic performance. And maybe it's that they're not eating enough, they can't concentrate. Um, and so that may be the first group to identify some of these concerning symptoms. And so I think something that probably all of us can do, you know, from orthopedic surgeons to coaches to, you know, current athletes is when we see these things, just try to make others around us also feel empowered to speak up. And to, if there's anything concerning to say, oh, I, I, this was a change for him or her, like, let me, can I just talk to you about it for a minute? It may be nothing, but that may also be the, the early diagnosis of a more significant issue. Um, Nicole, what do you think about, you know, do you think there's value for kind of a peer to peer support? Yeah. I mean, especially I think now with COVID, like my teammates are pretty much the only people I see anymore. Um, so it's important that we can have those kind of conversations, the important conversations besides just what we chat about on runs or at practice. Um, cause I think really for the most part, most of us, our biggest support network is within the team. So if we can have those kind of conversations with the team, it makes it a lot easier to sort out issues. Plus, you know, like once again, kind of like what we've been saying, you're not alone in it and it kind of makes it easier to sort out issues. We're like, okay, like I recognize that this isn't just a me thing. This is something that like, I can have, I have my teammates there to support me. My teammates care about me. And like, I know that like, whatever I need help with, like, they'll be there for me. Yeah. That's, and that's a really important source of support. Uh, just on a daily basis, but also certainly if there are any issues that come up, um, feeling safe to talk to each other about it. Yeah. Um, we did have one question in the, um, in the chat. So asking about, um, Liz, I'll direct this to you. So about getting adequate calcium in athletes who are dairy free, right? Not drinking milk, eating cheese, et cetera. Like what would be your recommendations? So I think a few things is, you know, recommended daily calcium is about a thousand milligrams for, you know, an adult female. So keeping that in mind, um, if you're dairy free, I mean, there is calcium fortified almond milk, soy milk, oat milk, uh, orange juice. Uh, you can get calcium in many vegetables and beans and tofu. So you know, there are several ways to get it. I think if you're concerned, I mean, certainly taking a calcium and vitamin D in a multivitamin or 
uh, one of the calcium chews that you can buy at the um, drugstore is a good way to supplement. Um, I always want to just tell people though that taking extra calcium is not going to improve your bone health or make your bones any stronger. Actually too much calcium can be detrimental. So getting the right amount is important, but uh, getting extra is, is not going to help you. But very good point. And, and also helping, you know, our athletes, coaches and, and athletic trainers, et cetera, understand that it's calcium and vitamin D both are critical, right? Because uh, vitamin D helps with the absorption of calcium. So, you know, if you're in a, a sunny place, maybe they're going to get enough vitamin D uh, just by being outside a little bit, but otherwise having some sort of combination of calcium and vitamin D is important. So they actually get the absorption um, of calcium, but yeah, a lot of great suggestions there. Um, Nicole, so from, from your perspective too, if, you know, you guys have access to a lot, a lot of different physicians, a lot of different resources at Tulane, um, what are some of the different disciplines that you've interacted with? Like when there are any issues, so, I mean, you have always have easy access to sports medicine, physicians, et cetera, but what about outside of sports medicine? Are there other, um, sort of medical specialties that you guys have pretty easy access to? Um, I know one thing that first, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like that we have a dedicated nutritionist within athletics. I think that's a pretty new thing here, which is exciting because we didn't used to, it used to be the same one that addressed issues all throughout campus. So it's kind of hard to get in touch with them since he was, or he or she was so busy anyway. Um, but it's nice that we now have that dedicated resource there. Yeah, that's awesome. What about, um, sports psychology, et cetera? Do you guys have uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Easy that, like, in, in recent in like the last like uh two years I believe uh now we have a dedicated sports psychologist she's in our athletic center all the time um she's really really easy to get into contact with I know she works with I know that it's a huge percentage of our athletes they told us and I was like oh wow like everybody's talking to her um she's very popular I think she's been a really really good resource at Tulane Right. And so I think that can be another stigma is kind of the psychological or mental side of um you know mental health, men, you know, the, the psychological aspect of being successful as an athlete. But as we touched on, you know, even with regard to red S or just being an athlete in general, the, the psychological side is so important to how you perform and actually can be like a major limiting factor in being successful. So, um, you know, eliminating any stigma associated with that is important too, to really maximize your individual success and then success of the team as well. Um, we kind of touching, you know, expanding, I guess, a little bit on this interdisciplinary aspect, Liz mentioned several of these um, groups earlier, but, um, you know, there are, there are women's sports medicine programs all over the country, and really, uh, they're a fantastic resource. Part of that is that the program brings together a network of providers in various specialties who are all interested and dedicated to women's health, to taking care of athletes, to maintaining, maintaining health, and uh, performance and getting you back to doing the things that you want to do. And um, there are several disciplines and that's why the interdisciplinary approach is so important. So there's of course, orthopedics, the sports medicine aspect, primary care, sports medicine, but also endocrine as Liz touched on OBGYN is important to have in there sports, nutrition, sports psychology, um, and having easy access to all of these people is really critical. So we're lucky to have that at Tulane too, and have easy access to those different people. They're not all located in one place. And I actually would be pretty surprised if, if at any of our um, kind of the women's sports programs around the country, if everybody's in one location, but the bottom line is it's easy to access them. And so that's a critical component of the program, because if I see a patient who has, you know, a stress fracture or, you know, shin splints, uh, and I'm asking all the questions that Liz mentioned before, if a concern is raised or, you know, I'm worried about something, I may refer, you know, the athlete to one of my, one of my OBGYN colleagues or to, um, you know, a, a counselor for eating disorders or to sports psychologists. Um, and so having that built in network is really important and helps facilitate that treatment. So Liz, is there anything else you would add in terms of the interdisciplinary approach to taking care of, of these types of issues? Uh, I mean, I work most closely with, I think, you know, as you mentioned, physical therapy, primary care, nutrition, uh, endocrine, and sports psychology. I think they would be my, my biggest core group of referrals for um, our athletes that have um, any of the risk factors or signs and symptoms of red S. Excellent. Um, so a couple of questions here. I'll start with the second one. So great question here. Um, 
the question, which I'll just, I'll, I'll throw out to the group, but what resources do you recommend for athletes who are at division three schools or really any school who play club sports and may not have access to easy access to all of these resources? Um, you know, what general recommendations can we make for these athletes in terms of, you know, getting the appropriate education or getting access? I guess, Liz, do you want to start with that? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is the kind of million dollar question how we can make everyone more aware. And I think, you know, hosting a webinar just like this to, to bring more awareness to what this is, um, trying to educate our athletes, our parents, our volunteer coaches at the youth level as much as possible. Um, so it's basically, I think, through education and awareness that we're going to be able to help uh, support are athletes that don't have all the resources. And those tend to be the athletes that I probably do worry about the most. I mean, I think our you know, division one athletes do have a fair amount of resources available to them. Um, and it is the athletes that are playing club sports that kind of go uh, under the radar uh, that may not you know, have someone saying, well, you, you look tired today, or you know, why is your performance you know, seem to be declining and your time's getting slower or you, know, you don't seem as strong. Um, and they don't have eyes on them in the same way. So I think that's a really good point. And that's where kind of the grassroots efforts of um, education awareness come in. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. It's just being, being aware of it. And, and then it's kind of a little bit more on an individual basis to say like, well, I think something's not quite right and, and seeking out care. So here at Tulane, like any of the Tulane students can come see us in our sports medicine clinic. It's very easy for them to do that. They can come through Tulane, the student health. Um, and I'm sure that there are similar opportunities at other institutions, but you don't have the other people looking out for those athletes, like you were saying, Liz. So the athletic trainer or Jay, the coach or the strength and conditioning coach or someone just saying something's not quite right. Um, so it does depend a lot more on the education of the individual in that sense. Um, Nicole, can you, I'm going to direct this question to you. So can you talk to us a little bit about sort of sleep hygiene, the importance of sleep in what you do as an athlete and in, in maintaining a high level of performance? Yeah. Um, so obviously sleep is going to be really, really important. Otherwise you're just dead for practice, especially on Fridays. We have 545 in the morning practice. So you got to go to bed nice and early for that. Um, but especially now that I'm spending so much time on my computer all day, I've realized that I need to get off my screens much earlier than I used to, just because otherwise it's really, really hard for me to fall asleep at night. So I try to tend to like save the stuff that I need textbooks or just handwritten stuff for later in the evening. And I try to do my, all the stuff on my computer earlier in the night, just because otherwise I don't sleep very well. And I've be definitely been to practice where I haven't slept well and you it definitely shows. Um, but I think now more than ever, like now that we're all spending so much time in front of screens, it's more important to just be aware of the fact that it kind of disrupts your sleep and like try to make little changes that make it a little bit easier for you. That's so important. And how, um, how much do you sleep a night? Just out of, I'm happy to say that I, I mean, I'm not happy to say, but I'm happy to share that I sleep like six hours a night, which is not nearly enough, but, um, but it's when you're, when you're, you know, you're training, you're working, doing these hard workouts, you're getting up super early. What's your goal amount of sleep per night? Um, ideally, I would prefer to shoot for nine. Uh, sometimes it, I'll, it'll, I'll let it go as low as seven, but at that point, I'm like, okay, the school can wait. I, I'll find some time in the day, next day to do it. Uh, there's always, I can always find like 20, 30 minutes somewhere between practices and between classes. Uh, if it's really going to kick into my sleep like that, it's just going to make me really unproductive the next day. So it's not worth staying up late to grind out an assignment. It's all about yeah. time management throughout the week. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you realize that like staying up for that extra half hour is not going to help you that much, but getting that extra half hour, hour of sleep is going to make a huge difference. And actually you'll probably get that task done much faster the next day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. go ahead, Jay? Sorry, we have a little thing that we do with our athletes that it's, we call it a check-in. So every morning when they wake up, they kind of do a mini survey of how they're feeling, how they sleep last night. Um, how are they feeling about academics? Just kind of trying to get a feel for their mood for the day. And there's definitely a correlation as and how they slept and how they are feeling about everything else in their life. If they had a good night's sleep, all of the other categories tend to be higher. If they didn't sleep well or they didn't get very much sleep for whatever reason, then they're not feeling good about the tests that they have coming up their their whole mood is <laughs> declining wow i love that and what is it you guys use an app or how do you do that 
It's an app that we have and it's the kids log in every morning and it's like five, a five question survey that probably takes them 30 seconds before they roll out of bed and then the information gets shot over to the coaches so we can kind of take a look at it before practice to get a pulse for the team. And it's very interesting to see. And it's actually helped us a lot because sometimes, you know, there'll be a kid that'll be in the red zone and you'll just kind of walk over to them and say, hi, how are you doing today? And they just will, it's an opportunity for them to completely unpack. And sometimes that's just what they need to do. That is fantastic. I have never heard of that. I just think that's awesome. And probably not that difficult a thing to sort of implement, right? What a nice way to check in with the athletes. Yes. And, and, and like you said, it sort of gives them that opportunity. They're like, we know the coaches got my like responses from this yeah. thing this morning. And it was awful. Um, Liz, have you, uh, is, do you guys use anything like that? Um, you know, at any of the programs that you cover? Uh, not at any of the immediate programs, but when I've traveled with some of our, um, national teams, um, they do have check-ins very similar to that. They also, you know, have check-ins where they weigh the athletes on a daily basis to make sure that they're maintaining um, healthy weight and not losing, staying hydrated, getting their sleep. I mean, it all, all plays a role. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, to have kind of a pulse on all of those different things. Yeah, really important. Um, can you, you know, we will, what we'll do too, there's uh, just um, Tyler, actually, thanks for that comment. Um, just, uh, I'm sure he's not the only one too, asking about access to that sleep tool. So Jay, maybe you can in follow-up email me the information. We're gonna send up, send out some um, information and follow-up to everybody that registered. And so we can send information about that sleep app too. Perfect. Um, Liz, Jay, and Nicole, any questions that you wanted to pose to anyone else on the panel, anything you're interested in discussing further? Um, has anyone ever had a, uh, bone stress injury themselves? I have I, not. I was very, very lucky when I was an athlete. I have uh, not. My, Go ahead, Nicole. I mean, my freshman year in the spring, I had a stress fracture and two stress reactions in my tibia all at the same time. So. Ugh. And what did you do? Uh, I'd take four months off of running. I swam for four months. Uh, could have been two lane swim and dive 22, but alas. <laughs> That's awesome. Any, any That's take awesome. home messages you want to share from that experience or? Um, I think really just that kind of shunted me into a thing where I was like, okay, I have to be more aware of this. Cause I thought I was eating right. I thought I was doing all these things. Right. But was, I think it was, especially for me, it was overtraining. I was like, Oh, if I like run so much, I'll be so good. But I think you have to realize that like rest is just as important as training hard. Uh, fueling is very important. Uh, getting enough sleep is important. It's the little things. Uh, running really hard every single day isn't going to do anything good for you. And you got to respect your body in that respect. Those are really insightful comments, Nicole. And just mentioning that recovery is a critical component of training, right? As if not more important than the actual training itself, whether you're running or you're training, this, you're skiing or whatever you're doing, but allowing that time for your body to recover is really important. Um, and I, I certainly emphasize all those things to my patients too, and telling them that trying to incorporate a day of rest, a day of complete rest is really important. Not that they have to be sedentary, but just not that high level of physical activity. And then also incorporating a mix of, you know, having that sort of higher impact activity, but also having low impact or no impact activity and that you still get good cardiovascular benefit from those things. Um, I think no, no, uh, I mean, I think that running especially is the type of uh, runners are, um, tend to really think that running more, like you were saying, and you had that sort of mentality when you suffered these injuries that running more will make you a better runner and make you stronger and make you run faster and, and whatnot. But, um, but it's just that constant kind of repetitive uh, activity that can lead to those overuse injuries. And, and uh, I think that all of us have the opportunity to help educate and help everyone understand that by incorporating other activities, you decrease the risk of injury and actually make yourself perform better. Um, because you're giving your body chance, a chance to kind of rest uh, and, and you know, be away from that high impact activity. Is there anything else that you would add to that, Liz? No, I mean, I think, you know, we've touched on, you know, again, the really important points. The, the only other thing I would add is that for, you know, any, you know, our male athletes um, 
testosterone levels can play a role in bone density and stress fractures, especially in our male endurance athletes. And in our female athletes, if you are having abnormal periods as an endurance athlete or any athlete is not normal. Um, and I think that's a really key point. And that's probably one of the only indicators that we have as a red flag of your bone health. And so paying attention to that and being aware of that can be very important for your uh, bone health for the long term. Yeah, really, really critical to emphasize that again, too, because I think certainly, especially for our young athletes, you know, I, I said this a little bit jokingly earlier, but it's not, uh, not meant to be a true joke at all, but just for them to understand that it's not, it's not cool. It's not a good thing to have irregular periods or to go three months without having a period um, that really it's important. And that whole process serves a critical role and, and helps significantly with bone health. Um, and that's, it's sort of like this hidden thing, like you said, right? There's no outward signs of it. You don't know that the bones are getting weaker. Um, and the only real indication we have is the menstrual cycle, like their, their menstrual history. Um, all right. And here's another question, speaking a little bit to sleep, but, um, you know, all of us as athletes at some point in our lives have had the experience of traveling and changing time zones and being, you know, maybe you're going for a, a, a big competition and that affects your sleep. Um, you know, Jay, I'll, I'll throw this to you, uh, from the coach's perspective and dealing with your athletes and from your experience as an athlete yourself, um, how did you handle that? Uh, in terms of potential jet lag, the, you know, how it affects your sleep, your nutrition, how do you maintain those things when you have that travel uh, factored in there? Yeah, I think a big thing is time management, knowing, you know, before you go on the trip, what to expect, you know, when the flight is, or, you know, th things could get jumbled. Um, but as far as nutrition is concerned, that the last thing you ever want is tired and hungry athletes not a good combination so what we do actually is we give our kids snack packs before we go on a travel trip so everybody has the gallon size zip up bag full of snacks so that if anything happens or we're stuck in the airport or hotel for longer than we expect that hunger is not going to be an issue they're going to be able to fuel their bodies um, and then also just I provide them a very detailed itinerary so they know when we're going to eat, what we're going to eat, when they're going to have time to sleep. So they're able to plan that out and just mentally also preparing to know that, you know, maybe these two days are going to be really rough for me this week, but I'm going to get to catch up and I have an off day. And then as a coach, being conscious of you know, your travel schedule and knowing, you know, we push the kids really hard for two or three days when we get back maybe we need an extra off day that week, or maybe we're going to bring them in for practice. And we're going to say, Hey, everybody, we're going to do homework for two hours instead of practice. So when you go home, you can go to sleep early tonight, stuff like that. So just being aware, most coaches are pretty realistic. And if the kids are tired, the coaches are probably even more tired. <laughs> so just making adjustments to the schedule and letting the kids know, you know, you need to communicate. We tell the kids, you know, if you're too tired or you have school comes first, uh, your sport comes second. So we have to prioritize that and your health is above both of those things. So just being aware, having the kids communicate and as a coach, just being smart about preserving your athletes and knowing that their health is first and foremost at all times. Yeah, thank you. Those are really insightful comments and um, really important from the coach's perspective to be looking out for the athletes uh, and just help them take care, you know, provide them with the resources they need to stay healthy, to stay active. Um, and, and, you know, decrease the risk that they're going to suffer any type of injury. And I love that too. Sometimes just devoting practice to homework, right? Well, so nice. And then they get to go home and just go to sleep. Um, so we're getting close to seven o'clock here, central time. Um, it has been absolutely fantastic. I have loved this discussion and really appreciate, uh, everyone's input. Thanks also for the questions in the chat. Um, uh, certainly I'll give everybody a chance to kind of give their parting um, thoughts, but I'll let you all know that we will send some information and follow up. Um, we'll even, you know, send uh, information about some recent publications just with background information on Red S for anyone that's interested in reading that. We'll get you that information too about the sleep app that uh, Jay was talking about. 
And, um, and certainly if, if any of you have questions and follow up to any of that, you can um, email us and, and we'll be able to circulate those questions to get some good responses. So um, Liz, any, any final thoughts? Um, final thoughts. Uh, bones, not diamonds are a girl's best friend. I'll leave it out. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that is great. Um, Nicole. Um, I mean, I just think it's important, as we've said, just to make sure that this information is widely available. Um, the more people that know about it, the more people that can take the preventive measures needed. Absolutely. And Jay? Um, I think just destigmatize, educate, and encourage your athletes to communicate how they're feeling. Yeah, really, really important. Just make everybody feel safe, empower everyone involved with taking care of athletes to, to speak up, to report anything, you know, just to, to initiate a discussion. Um, so that we all have, you know, our, our athletes and patients health uh, as our top priority. So, um, so thank you all again so much. We really appreciate it. Hope everybody enjoyed the webinar and uh, have a great night. Stay safe.